it's that time of year again. It's time for the mid-season review, MotoGP 2024 season. Once again, lucky enough to be joined in this video, we're going podcast style with Luke, who we've had on many times before. You know him well. Uh, and again, we're, we're covering everything here from the rider movements in the break to who's been disappointing and who we're predicting to go on and have a good second half of the season. Make sure you jump down in the description there. Follow Luke on, I think I'll put his Twitter there or something. Big things come for him soon as well. So make sure you get on board with him at the ground floor, as they say. Very knowledgeable guy when it comes to all motorcycle racing. Good journalist. So make sure you give him a follow. And like I said, there's a lot coming for him in the next sort of six, 12 months as well. So get on board now and uh, enjoy. Enjoy this little chat. Thank you. Hey, we're on. Luke, how are we? Not spoken to you since the start of the season. Uh, how have you been? What's happening? You enjoying uh, yeah. the first start of the season? Yeah, yeah, not too bad, thank you, mate. Um, yeah, the season's been good so far. It's been different, but also very similar, if that makes sense. Uh, had a few of the the usual suspects at the front, some surprise names fighting at the front as well, and some people struggling that I wouldn't have expected to. So I think all around it's been good. And obviously the rider market's been, been good with silly season happening over the summer break as usual. We're absolutely going to do rider market stuff because sometimes that's the most interesting part, right? Yeah. Like, but let's start. I mean, you mentioned, I mean, I didn't really have a plan for this episode thing, but you've mentioned riders that are struggling. I think that's a good place to start. I was probably going to start with Peko, but I think this is probably a bit better. We'll, we'll go. You've mentioned a few guys that are struggling. Who's on your list? Who's on your hit list for the first re- nine rounds of the season? Well, Obviously, you've got to look at the Hondas, but we kind of expected them to have a rough year again, so I'll give them a bit of benefit of the doubt. But the main one that I've noticed this year is Marco Bezzecchi. He just has not been able to get to grips with that 2023 Ducati. It's been dire. What What's he had? I've, I've got a, one podium so far this season compared to Bezzecchi last year at this point who had a win, multiple wins at this point last season. Very much in the title hunt at this point last season, wasn't he? Yeah. And then it's just gone it's just gone a bit away. And he's been easily um outperformed by Digi and Antonio, which he Digi came on good last year, but Bez we all thought was superior and it's just gone wayward for Bez. Like there's not really much more to say on him other than he's just struggling and it's really disappointing to see because he was potentially a championship favorite not for this year but years you know the next two three years he'd be in the hunt i think everyone for i guess that takes us into like a bit of rider market stuff as well doesn't it because it was one of those things where with with aprilia him signing for aprilia now um and then having a bad season i mean this can happen it doesn't mean you're bad overnight i guess i've always had this thing where it's like you can get written off very quickly in moto gp uh and, and in saying that he's not been awful it's just not been quite as good you know what i mean i mean it, yeah. in fact you probably have him is he behind digi for you at the moment i think pure talent wise he's not but just at the moment on pure form yeah he's, he's yeah behind. so i mean but it's a close call right so in that sense it's not like he's doing terribly um like he's doing okay but yeah getting that deal done with a pretty nice and quick for him there is obviously uh, you can relax a little bit about it. You can relax a little bit. Yeah. Um, I've, I've always, from the start of the season, I've had a, a sneaky suspicion he'd be off to Aprilia. Um, I didn't see his, who his teammate's going to be. I never had that down in my predictions. But, I, you know, there'd been all this talk of they wanted an Italian rider and there was a bit of between, would it be Bastianini, would it be Bez? I just... Always had the feeling that Bez would get the call purely because of his performances last year compared to Bastianini's. And I know Bastianini was unfit for a lot of last season, but even when he was fit and he just wasn't the same level as Bez. So yeah, I'm 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 happy for Bez, don't get me wrong. I think it's a deserved move and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what you can do on that approach. Yeah, and I think it's one of those bikes that I think it just seems like the kind of bike where if if a rider can maybe, if they're struggling, again, it's a tough field when you're on a Ducati because there's like eight really competitive guys, you know, like eight really competitive guys. So it can make you look average pretty quick. Um, 
but stepping over to Aprilia, it seems pretty rideable as far as you can tell, I guess, watching from here. And guys, you, you feel like guys can push that a little bit. So guys like Martin and Bez, you think, might suit it, you know, in that sense. Um, but who else Who else is on your on your underperformance hit list? I, I, I kind of have Bez on mine, I guess, only because of his performances last season. Not so much that he's been that bad this season. But I take your point completely. So who else have you got there? Um, again, Augusto Fernandez hasn't been great, but then last season, I think at this point, he'd been overperforming. So I kind of give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, no, I'm harsh on him. Okay. Um, okay. Go away. Yeah. <laughs> but then also, in the same sentence as Jack Miller, who has definitely had an absolute stinker to the start of the year. To the point of well, we were saying just before we started recording, rumours that he's off to World Superbikes. So that's how uh, poor it has been for Jack. What sixteenth in the championship so far? Best result of fifth so far. It's uh, it's not been great for uh, for Jack. It's um, I mean, I'm sure you have uh, some thoughts on it, being uh, being as though he's your rider. Yeah, yeah. Look, it, it's it's real dis- It is disappointing. And again, I don't think guys just go off overnight something's happening there it's not work for him whether it's him compatibility wise with the bike or with the direction they're going or it's maybe it's him himself not feeling it you know you, sometimes you get like that right it has been disappointing because i had high expectations for it well for them as a manufacturer i mean aside from augusto which i didn't expect much from to be honest and like i said i'm i don't have that much sympathy for him because not because I like obviously they're all good, but I didn't expect him to do much better than he's doing. To be honest, um, they just showed a glimpse of form, Augusto, going in uh, towards the end of this. Uh, yeah, last season he showed a bit there that I was like, he actually looks like he might be getting the hang of it. But to be honest, I thought this might be his last season, and I'm thinking it probably is now um, with the way the grid looks like it's shaping up. Uh, but with Jack, um, yeah, it's just I mean. It, you don't want to be too harsh, do you? But it's not been good enough, has it? Like it's, it's hard. The, the worst part for me is like, cause sometimes when Jack's quick, he still doesn't get the results. He'll crash a bit or sometimes he falls back throughout the races as the race goes on, you know, in a longer race, especially he can, he can maybe run at the front for a while, but he drops back to seventh, eighth, ninth, whatever. But at the moment, the worrying thing is that he doesn't even have the actual pace. It's not there at all. Like the one that pace, like he, even when he was like last season, where it was like Binder was powering him up basically, but he was still putting it on the front row every now and then. And he was quick and it like over a lap, he, he, he could get something out of the bike, but this year he doesn't have that at all. So yeah, I'm not surprised the direction that KTM's gone in terms of leaving him out. I do think there is a place for him on the grid. Like I think someone will look at a guy like Jack and go, there's value there. Uh, and I think KTM could have looked at him and seen that there was still value there if you can keep him happy and you get him in form and stuff like that. But I'm not surprised. Uh, and like I said, with his rumors now of going to World Superbikes, it's starting to look like that would be a good option for him because he's, I think he's good on those kind of bikes. You know, I think he suits it. He loves doing his little, um, his little race in, in Adelaide sometimes in South Australia, you know, at the Australian Superbikes and stuff like that. I think it would be good for him. But it's one of those things. Do you prefer to just stay on the grid, if even if you're in a less than desirable situation, or would you prefer to go off somewhere else and try something new and try and win somewhere else? Um, you know, tough decision to make, I suppose. But it's promising that the offer's there, if it is, if it's true, um, that Ducati would be interested uh, to take him towards the bikes. But yeah, it is. It, it is one I agree with you on that one. Definitely um, not quite been good enough there, Jack. Um, I don't think who else we got on that list. There is, I mean, if I go through now, I'm just looking at the championship standings here, uh, just as a general guide. Uh, I mean, other than, like you said, you mentioned the Hondas. Mm. At what point is Marini underperforming? Because you always got to have to be sympathetic because he's, he's obviously come into a difficult situation. Brand new there. 
But again, he's not been... Zarko's not quite struggled like that. He, like, they've all struggled, but he struggled a lot. Yeah, Zarko... The thing with Zarko, he's got a lot... How do I say this without making Zarko seem really old? He's got a lot more experience than Luca has on difficult bikes. Zarko made... Even when he was at Yamaha, say, it wasn't the best situation. I think Zarko made the best out of the situation he was in, in that Tech 3 team at the time. He went to KTM, and obviously that fell apart very quickly. Um, but I think he's got more experience in the lesser teams. He did, oh, what was the team called? The Real Avintia team. He was in with them for that one year, and I think... For him to fight back from that to be where he is was obviously good. And then to get pushed out to, to Honda, really, I think, again, he's just making the best of a bad scenario. Um, whereas Marini's come from only ever knowing the Ducati, only wanting a bike to feel how the Ducati did to him. And now to be at Honda, you know, he's probably been promised the world, let's be honest, because that's what Honda have done over the years. And... He said last season he wanted to break away from his brother's sort of be, breaking away from his brother's shadow and trying to make his own path. And he needed to go to a factory team. Maybe not the right time to do it because Honda is in shambles. There's, there's no other way to say it. We talk about it a lot. Uh, I think everyone does enough. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just one of those things again for Luca where maybe leaving Ducati wasn't the right choice even though it's a factory team so you'd be inclined to give him a bit of a pass on this first half of the season uh yes and no i mean i'm just looking at his results now he's got one point so far this season his teammate mia again you know has experience on the bike will be staying he's up to what 13 points mm -hmm. marini's the lowest out of the point scorers I mean, below Danny Pedroza, who's done one race, but obviously we know Danny's Danny's Danny. He will always yeah. do well when he comes in as a wild card. Last place out of the Hondas, behind Alex Rins, who's had a terrible season as well. It's it's just it's weird and it's difficult to see for Luca because I like Luca. Um, I think he's a very talented rider. It's just even Mir and Zarco and Taka, they've all got talent in their own right. None of them are just in MotoGP because they've paid for their way in, or, or you know, any of those sort of scenarios. They're they're all there on their talent alone, and the fact that Luca is so far down the order with only one point is shocking. But also, you know, it, it, it's the, you can't keep giving him the benefit of the doubt, and you have to say maybe it's just a step too far for his talent, possibly. Possibly. Yeah, I mean, I, it has been a little disappointing because when you used to watch him on the Ducati, you always look like it's never, like, obviously Bez had an amazing season. So when you're comparing the two, it looks like he maybe wasn't quite on that level. But if you take him independently as just a Ducati rider um, compared to the other Ducatis and things like that, I thought he was always really strong. I thought he was always really strong. Uh, and to see it now, just I didn't think he would struggle as much as he has. Um, not that I thought that he would be better than me, but yeah, it's, I mean, again, when you, like you say, you, you know, Mir, Zarko, Nakagami have all been doing a decent job, but what the, with what they've got available to them, they're all doing okay. Uh, but Marini's the one that like, sometimes you're watching her in the race and you're like, he's so far behind the next guy up the road, let alone to the mid pack or whatever. He's a long way behind the next guy up the road a lot of the time. So it's, it's not looking great, but again, he's got another season on that bike, doesn't he? So maybe he'll sort it out. Um, I mean, he's not crashing. That's the only thing he's got going for him. But then is he going quick enough to crash? I mean, he's the only Honda rider who's not crashed out of a race so far this season. Uh, I don't know about sprint races. I can't say for that. But out of main races, he's not crashed out of a single one of those yet. So... There's that. Maybe he's his way of learning is different to everyone else's. Because obviously Mark Marquez, we'd see, would, well, he still does to an extent on the Ducati, chucks the bike down the road, 
to find its limit. Luca, mm. I think, is probably more like his brother in the way of they're more methodical and try to think their way around the problem rather than crash their way into the problem and then know that that's as far as they can go. So, yeah, I, it's just it's one of them things. It, I think that's a really interesting point, actually, that you bring that up. Because I, and it, and now I didn't know that, that he hadn't DNF'd any of the Grand Prix this year. So that does change my outlook on it a little bit because I am sometimes critical of guys where it's like, and people say this a lot, and I had this last year where I was like, you know, it's very like, oh, they need to fix that bike. It's dangerous. Every time he goes fast on it, he's crashing, you know, with Mark and stuff like that. I'm like, well, surely your job is to finish the race in the fastest amount of time without crashing. That's your job. And then it's their job to make the bike quicker with the feedback you're giving them. So if you're finishing the races, you can be like, look, that's where it gets to for me. So what can we do to, I don't know if that's making sense, but it, I'd almost, I would almost rather that than seeing a guy crashing every single week. I know not all of them are crashing every week. So you, there is more pace in that bike because other guys are scoring points. But for him, first season there, for the way he rides, maybe it is more difficult. I don't know. But yeah, maybe that is. But maybe he's, they've said to him, like, we'd rather you just didn't crash and we get a full race worth of data every single race. And then from there, we can try and do something. We get extra test days and all this stuff with their concessions. So maybe that's better. Maybe that's what they want. Maybe he's doing what they ask him to do, you know. But yeah. I mean, that's speculation for me. There's been no talk that HRC are unhappy with them. And normally they're quite, they they don't keep it secret when they're unhappy with a rider normally, especially when you think about it, like when Lorenzo was there, there was quite often talk of, how unhappy they were with him. Um, but I was just looking as well. Zarco's only crashed out of two Grand Prix, main Grand Prix again, unsure on sprints. Um, and Taka's only crashed out of two main Grand Prix. So, and when you look at Taka, he's, his best result this season has been 14th place, and he's finished that five times. So it's like, again, he's not doing like extremely well, but he's finishing, and those are probably races when a lot of people have crashed. And he's just picking up the points by just staying on the bike. And that's so, how Luca got his point recently as well. I mean, maybe in the post Marquez era, Honda's thinking like we spent enough money on repairing bikes and me last year as well. They're like, Can, yeah. guys, just stay on. We don't care if you finish 10 seconds behind the guy in second last, just stay on. You know, don't send it down the road. Bring your data back with you. Bring the bike back in one piece. Yeah. They, I mean, I, th I think. When you're struggling, you come and last anyway. You may as well just do that, right? Yeah. Um, almost like when you send a wild card out there for a Grand Prix and you're like, look, mate, just don't crash it. You know, don't care where you finish your wild card, whatever, you know? Yeah, that, that's the same thing with Stefan Bradl. Normally, I'm quite vocal. But Stefan Bradl, I don't think, is a good test rider, um, especially when they put him in a race scenario. Behind closed doors, he might be brilliant. We don't really see much of that. But from what we see from him on the TV when he does wild cards, he normally crashes all the time. There's normally a Stefan Bradle crash, and it's normally right towards the end of the race when you'd want him to stay on. But this season, he's stayed on. He's finished every wild card he's done. So, so I, I think can't... we've unlocked why I think we've unlocked why Honda's so slow. They're like, do not crash. Yeah, I think we figured it out. So they're they just, just sending each rider out there to be like, just finish. Like, just finish the race. Do not crash this bike. And they're all going out there like, yeah, but I have to go so slow. It's like, that's your job. We're paying you. Finish the race as quickly as you can, but not to the point where you crash. That's it. That's the limit. And they're doing it. They're all doing it. I want to say as well that Luca might be the only... Oh, no. Bender's not crashed out of the main Grand Prix yet this year either. Is he no, and uh, neither's, neither's Bastianini. He might have crashed and rejoined, but neither of them have DNF from crashing out of races, like main Grand Rees. Binder's, uh, Binder's a good one, actually. Is he on your disappointing list? Or is well, KTM generally on your... I mean, he's not been as good as Pedro, has he? KTM's not been that good, though, recently, I, I'd also have to say, because Pedro's fallen away a little bit as well as the season's gone on. I think the rookie sort of... The rookie in him starting to show a little bit, but... um. 
but that's expected. You know, he's 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 listed as Pedro and says as you know the the next best thing. He's going to be the next Rossi, the next Marquez. But you know, they've all they all struggled in their rookie seasons. I know Marquez won the championship, but it wasn't easy. So. Yeah, Mark you know, is an exception, but though, wasn't he? It's a bit, yeah. bit different. If you if you can if you're a rookie champion, it's like yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, everyone else, you know. Yeah, I mean, Rossi, they... Rossi run won races in his first season, I suppose, as well, didn't he? Yeah, maybe all... that level is a bit higher. They all struggled in their rookie season, all of them. Think of Pac in his rookie seasons. At Pramac, he was oh, he was disgusting. Like there were talks that he shouldn't be in Moto GP, but yeah. well, back then when you when you looked at that team, it was him and Jack, wasn't it? So yeah jack was the one where you were like well he's the one that's going to press on eventually you know he's the one's getting the factory seat and all that stuff um can he be a world champion and Pecco's just you know well Pecco's Pecco isn't he now like Pecco is Pecco. Yeah. um but yeah so binder then disappointing mm, or not no i i don't think so he's on a podium this year pass score um, for him pardon it's a pass score for him he's, he's right where he should be yeah, yeah, yeah. The KTM's not been great. It's clearly not kept up with I'd even say Ducati and Aprilia. I'd say Aprilia's potentially made a step in the hands of Vinales, I think it has. Maybe not in LA. Um but a Maverick's Maverick. But yeah, Binder, you know, he's been getting those average Binder results that he probably will get for the rest of his career. And I think he'd probably get no matter where he went. He's still a good rider, but I don't think the package is quite what it was last year and potentially even the year before no i agree I, I i don't think the ktms they haven't made the step that you'd expect them to have made i thought they'd be almost the main main challenger based on last season the pace that like like i said earlier jack miller could have over a lap and then the sort of stuff that binder was doing in the races but natural progression for them can they draw level with your caddy on terms of pace and things like that they're bringing pedro acosta in what can they do hasn't quite made that step. The bike doesn't look as competitive as last season. Um, and the only, I think the only spark has been Pedro, to be honest. I know Binder, I'd have him slightly disappointed because I'm the other thing, I have high expectations for Binder. I think he's a top level rider. I think he's top, top class. It's an interesting one because people would always argue with the fact that like, if he's top class, he doesn't, he's never really won enough races and that kind of thing. But I think when he has everything right for him, he can be a proper title challenger. But this year, I think he's been overshadowed a bit by Pedro. I mean, I know that in the championship, they're pretty close and Pedro has had his little fall off here, but Pedro's at least had the pace to have been running certain races, that podium contention. And you look down the field at the other KTMs and you're like, okay, where are they? You know, where are they? Um, so in that sense, I think he's been, he's been slightly underwhelming. I would say disappointing. Yeah, I think it's an interesting case because everyone will have their opinion on Binder because it's kind of, I mean, you still look at him, he's seventh in the World Championship. That's not too bad. That's not too bad. The guys that are ahead of him, Pedro's one of them, only two points ahead. And then the other guys ahead of him, it's only Vinales, Bastianini, Marquez, Martin, Bagnaia. Did you expect him to finish ahead of any of them? Maybe not. Maybe Vinales, but that's it. But he's had a race win this year, so, you know. Um, but yeah. I'm 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 kind of undecided on him, but it's not been too bad, I suppose. Not being too bad. Um, and the next one I want to talk about because this is other interesting seats that need filling, and we have confirmation on one of those seats, and that is at Trackhouse. Now, Ralph Fernandez, I've been advocating for all season because I think his little upturn in form. And even when before the results started coming in a bit earlier in the season, I thought the pace looked like it was at least there. He looked more comfortable. And I like the fact that he's been given another go. I'd like to see him have one more year on that bike at least. So he signed on for another – it is a one-year deal, isn't it? I think it's two years, actually. Oh, there you go. Yeah, 25 and 26. That'll do. Yeah. So, yeah, I've, I've been a big supporter of his this season. Uh, because I think he's, again, he's, he had a great opportunity. He was in the lead, I think of, was it at Barcelona? Or where yeah, was. I think it was. Yeah. And crashed now unlucky, but he's got race leading pace there. He has pace. 
is his practice session pace, and I don't take much stock into practice session pace, but the general trend has been moving him up the order. And obviously that sets you up for qualifying if you get into Q2 or Q1, whatever. So it's all been upward trajectory. It's been slow and it's been a bit of a grind, but everything is slowly going upwards for him. And I wouldn't say Oliveira has been beating him in that sense. So when you can match it with, I think Oliveira is quite good as well. He's another guy on the move now. Um, but I think, yeah. And, and when Trackhouse did their little announcement thing, I really love their social media actually. But when they did their little like, swipe tinder thing that they were doing i was 100 percent sure that was a you wouldn't do that for a rider you were just retaining so i thought that was strange yeah um but it was for Ralph. so i mean I'm, I'm liking his progression at the moment who joins yeah. him there actually well there's three names that kind of are floating around there was Obviously, Joe Roberts, where it's the track house, the prettier team, American run, American only, you know, the NASCAR side of it. But um, Davide Brivio, who's sort of like team manager, has sort of said, I don't want a rookie. He's been very vocal against it. So then the talk of Jack Miller came in. There was, you know, Jack's going to get the ride. Looks like he's out of, well, he is out of KTM, not looks like. Um, maybe he'll go there. Maybe they want that experience to go through. But then, I think it was the end of, of last week, maybe Friday or Thursday last week, this sort of talk came around from um, motorsport.com that Ayagura has signed with Trackhouse. Nothing's been officially confirmed <laughs> when we're recording this, but he's the name that's that's come through, and I like Ayagura. I've, I've made it no secret. I think I is a top talent in Moto2 for the last few years. Um, he deserves a MotoGP opportunity, and I think a prettier is better than his uh, other option of his other ties to Honda. So um, he'd be good, but then that ruins the whole thing of they didn't want a rookie, so why they wouldn't take Joe Roberts. So well, I also think it's a good rider and would make most sense for sponsors. So again, there's I think it's a bit of a three-way tie in a way but then the rumors for jack have resurfaced going to world superbike so has agora actually put pen to paper and is he off to the track house it's, it's one of those where it could go in many directions at the moment that seat yeah i thought the iagoras that surprised me a lot surprised me a lot not because i don't think he should be in there um but i guess the assumption was he would always get the honda the nakagami ride right i don't know why that is it's just like a japanese thing I don't know, like one goes out, one comes in. I don't know why. Um, but so on merit, I think he is good enough for another seat on the grid. I don't think it's one of those things where he's only ever going to get a seat because Honda wants a Japanese rider and they're sick of Nakagami. So I understand why you'd look at a guy like Aiguru. But like you said, if that is true, Brivier said he doesn't want a rookie in there, whatever. I thought if they were going to go for a rookie, it would definitely be Joe Roberts if they were looking to promote someone. Definitely Joe Roberts. Um, and then when the Miller stuff got mentioned, I thought that made sense for them. Like I said, I think Miller adds, has value, would have value to a lot of these teams, especially satellite teams. Um, you get an experienced guy. You know when he's happy and the thing's working for him, he can probably put it on the front row. You know, things like that are pretty valuable to, you know, satellite teams. And that's why you see things like in the past – Guys like Colin Edwards would get a ride forever as long as he put his hand up to keep going because teams would be like, yeah, I need that. I need that kind of guy, you know. Um, you know, and guys like Colin, you know, never want to race in MotoGP, but stayed on the grid for years and years and years because, first of all, he was quality, he was reliable. Um, he's a good character probably to have around. Jack fits that bill, you know. Um, I think these things are important to these teams and you can, and, and I guess with a guy like Raul Fernandez in there as your other confirmed rider, I know he's got a couple of years under his belt now, but he's still a pretty raw prospect. You know, you don't know if that could drop off a cliff at any moment. Uh, he's, he can, I mean, we don't, I don't know this, right. But my perception is that character wise, he could be a tad fragile rail with the way he reacted to certain things going against him in Moto2 and things like that. Look, he was a young man at the time. I'll give him a pass. He may have matured a lot since then. I know. How old is he? What, in his early 20s still? 
I was still a dickhead. I mean, I still am, but I was still definitely a dickhead when I was 22, 23 or whatever. You know, you don't mature until, you know, later on in your 20s, do you, properly. So, you don't know. He may have matured a lot in those last couple of years with the experiences he's having um, and the humbling he's had to take, you know. So, I, but it is still a kind of a risk with him, but slightly, um, as much as I like him. Uh, but then to, like you said, to take another rookie on now where we saw that Tech 3 had issues with this, just bringing a couple of rookies in all the time and never being happy, you know. So I would be surprised. Um, I'm not sure what other names are on the grid that they could possibly look at that would be a reliable choice for them, though, that that they'd be able to tempt across. But it is looking like it's going to be one of those three now, isn't it? And I guess Jack, does that mean Jack is out of that race now? <sighs> I'm I honestly how, so how reliable it like you say it was autosport reporting that it's done with Iagura, right? Or all but done. Yeah. Is that a rely would you consider that a reliable outlet to or a source to sort of be like, yeah, that's probably we can write that one off, that's done. Fill it in. Yeah, I think it was motorsport.com originally I saw, but it may have been I don't know who originally broke the story. Um but I'd like to say, yes, it is reliable, but obviously there's the thing of, is anything 100% reliable until we actually get, you know, official confirmation? Because we've had many times before that people are going to stay or they're going to go to this place and then last minute it doesn't happen. So I'd like to think it, it, it will be done. But again, the, the main issue I have with it is not, that it's a guru that's taking it. It's the thing that the statements from the team and from the management of saying, we don't want a rookie. We don't want a rookie all this time. We don't want Joe because he's a rookie. That's the only reason we don't want him. And then they just sort of backtrack on it and go, well, we are going to take a rookie. We're going to take a guru. And I've, I can't remember who said it or who reported it, but I remember reading or hearing that Agura's deal with HRC runs out at the end of the season. I think he had one year left when he joined, um, what's he with the MT helmets, MSI squad in Moto 2. So he's still got the HRC branding on his levers. Um, so he's still part of that team. So everyone was kind of expecting, oh, he's going to go to win him. It's who that's, you know, like you, like you said earlier, that's the, 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 the done deal sort of thing to keep that sponsorship in, to keep that sponsor happy. It's going to be a Japanese rider. Um, but maybe Agura's had this offer come through where he's doing so well. What, he's second in the championship, seven points behind his teammate. And again, he's only just ahead of Joe. So I just, the whole thing, I'm not a fan of the way it's been done. But I'd be happy with any of the three on the bike. It's the, it's the point as well that, that I'd, I'd get across. So I think all three of them could do good things for that team and that bike in different ways in their own different ways as well is there any part of this that's um uh maybe track house never really was interested in joe roberts but they've always been linked to him just because he's the best american available and they with maybe brivio brivio's in charge maybe he's not american he doesn't give a crap like maybe he said to him like look if i come in here and i take this job if i make a decision of the rider i want or the direction i want to go in we're doing it you want an American rider, find someone else. You know, maybe it's that kind of thing. He's like, I want to get you as high up the grid as possible. I want to get you the best two riders I can get, you know, and work with those guys. So, uh, again, all speculation, all speculation, just theory, you know. But is there a part of it that's like, maybe they were never that interested. Maybe Brivio is not interested in Joe Roberts, never was. Um, and the links all just come from the fact that it's Trackhouse. They're American and he's American. Um, so like and then he's obviously just gone well if i was looking at moto 2 right now and i can look at joe roberts who has shown speed in the past he has been solid but he's only ever really been this good once and it's this season whereas i agree has been this good for a while you know and he had one bad he had a bad season last season i think he had injuries and things like that as well but before that title challenger to the last round basically threw it away he should have won it um and before that he was always running near the front 
And then this season again, after a year of injuries, back to the front. He's not dropped off, you know. So maybe they're just looking at going, my best option in Moto2 of the guys that are available is Ayagura. If I have to take a rookie, I'm going to take the one that I think is the best and has been the best over a while. And you look at Sergio Garcia as well, obviously showing quality, but it's only the first time he's done it. So I wonder if a bit of this is, obviously the links to Jack are probably legitimate because like I said earlier, he adds value in a lot of ways. And then if you can't get him or you don't want him and you want another experienced guy, but there's none on the table that you can get, Miguel's being tempted by Pramac. Maybe they don't want to keep Miguel. Maybe there's issue. I don't know. They don't want it. Or he doesn't want there. You know, he maybe he just wants Pramac, you know. Um, so they said to him, do you want to stay? He's gone, no. I don't know what it is. But if they have to look outward and look at a rookie, maybe they were just like, no, no, no. I don't care what country they're from. I want the best available. And he may be it. So I'm wondering if there is a part of it that's just like, they just were never actually seriously interested in Joe Roberts. The links have come from outside. I would say that's highly likely. Again, speculation, not sure if it is true, but in in none of the times I've heard Brivio speak to MotoGP.com or uh, TNT Sport or if, um, you know, any of the Aprilia top brass, whenever they've spoke to, to the media, they've never said explicitly, yeah, we want Joe Roberts on that bike. They've, it's always been people in the media, people like us, who've gone, how cool would it be to see Joe Roberts on the track house of Prillia, you know, the American on the American bike, it would look just like Nicky Hayden back when he was at, um, was it Ducati that ran that, um, that livery with for him and it was the, the, the star spangled banner. So but you get it every week. Yeah. Like, it'd yeah. Be great. <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah. It would be. And obviously, you know, it would just, it would look right. That's the thing. And that, you know, his helmet design and his levers would all just look, it would just look right. But I think it has come down to the thing of, I think it's more an Aprilia team than it is an American team. I think Crackhouse have come in and they funded the team, but Aprilia run it as such. I don't know how much Trackhouse actually do behind the scenes or whether it's just a prettier running for <laughs> four bikes and, and four riders, especially since Raul was meant to get a factory machine at Silverstone. So yeah, I'd say now that Agura has proven that he can fight at the front of Moto2 and can challenge for championships, it's kind of gone the way of where well, he's available. He obviously doesn't want to go to Honda. He's turned them down, what, two years in a row now? He's, he's turned them down three years maybe now. So yeah, maybe they have had to, to backtrack a little bit on what they uh, what they originally were saying, but it's just one of them things. But it's sad because if we lose Jack off the grid, there's a chance we have no Australians in MotoGP. There's that will make, re- make me feel sick. There are yeah. There, imagine how 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 I felt the last few years. Um, there's been rumors... yeah, but we're we're a bit better than you guys, are we? Yeah. <laughs> there's been rumors that. Remy's going to come across, but then there's been rumours he's going to Moto Two. So uh, again, you're not sure on that front. Could have no Americans again, no British riders again, no Australian riders if Jack goes. So then there's that whole thing of three big markets that you want to tap into, and something that I've learned a lot about because you know I did my whole university major project I did on <laughs> the lack of sort of. Uh, output of MotoGP to those sort of countries. So, so I'm very passionate towards it. I just don't think it would be the right way to go about it. Not saying that, oh, Dixon deserves a MotoGP ride because he's British, because I don't think he does. Um, I don't think, you know, I don't think Miller deserves to just stay just because he's Australian, but I genuinely believe Joe Roberts deserves a ride in MotoGP, and again, not saying Trackhouse need to give him one. I just think he'll end up going to World Superbikes in a few years' time, probably if he can't get a MotoGP ride, and then we'll have missed out on another American star that we could have had in MotoGP. Um, it's just gonna. It looks like it's just gonna keep becoming this Spanish and Italian championship that we've seen for the last decade. I want to say really, it's kind of just been those sort of riders filtering through with the odd Brad Binder, 
Darren Binder, Miguel Oliveira, those sort of was it Javier Simeon who was Belgian that we had a few years back as well. So we've had the old ones like that, but it's never purely been that. And even the Asian market, they've had Taka really for the last however many seasons have we had Taka for now? Since it's 2018, I want to say he came along. So it, it's been a while that it's just been the sort of Spanish Italian route, and I think it's going to continue that way, sadly. That's like a that's a massive conversation, I think, with um the I mean, uh sometimes I always think to myself, like, well, those countries that aren't getting riders on the grid, step up your game, you know, what's your 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 levels like in terms of bringing young riders through and things like that? What's your programs like? I know in, in, in the UK here you it's very much more tailored towards a superbike style yeah. system that you come through. So whereas though the Spanish and the Italians, it's just, it's Grand Prix. It's yeah. all Grand Prix. It's all, everything is geared towards Grand Prix style bikes and coming through and being quick when you get to Moto3 kind of thing, that kind of bike. Um, Australia is a hard one because geographically it's very difficult. For, I, I would include Australia, South Africa. Um, I don't know if America, I don't know what America's like. Uh, maybe that's a bit more super bikey. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, but I know with Australians, it's like basically you stay in Australia and you grow up trying to get on like an Australian superbike grid or something like that and maybe move over to super, world super sports or something. Or your parents move you to Europe, to Spain when you're 12 and you have a crack. Like that's the only two ways to go. So it's it can be – but the thing is because you do send some good lads over to do that, you get guys like Jack Miller, Casey Stoner, whatever. Uh, so, but yeah, I, just having a look at it, it looks like if Jack does go, if Jack does go, is, I believe that um, Brad Binder would be the only native English speaker left on the grid. That's mad, isn't it? <laughs> Unless Remy Gardner. Comes Unless Remy. And, and Remy, another big opportunity coming this weekend for him to um, yeah. impress. And he was very good. I watched um where was Superbikes last week again? Uh Most. Uh, it's yeah, it was very good there. Mm. Could have got on the podium. I thought he almost should have in the end. Um impressing a lot. And I think I, I said this when he first got given the go. I was like, you would not do this unless you were trialing him. This is an audition. Hundred percent. Um, they want to see how he's gonna go. They think he's a point of difference. Maybe they can bring someone in that you know you don't have to turn to a rookie but you also don't have to turn to someone who's maybe ridden about 16 different moto gp bikes and like they they're past it or whatever like he's just maybe something a bit fresh i don't know and something from within the family still yeah within the family still yeah that's the the thing that i've spoken to a lot of people about obviously remy's in that family he's he's in the the grt yamaha world superbike team I would have thought at one point I had him down going to Pata Yamaha, the factory Yamaha squad and worlds to replace Jonathan Ray. Cause I thought he was going to call up quits at the end of the year. Maybe not now that he's sort of turned it around a little bit. Um, but I think, okay. Yeah. It's Pramac and it's Yamaha. They, they're most likely not going to be great next year, but you're going to get a factory MotoGP bike. Cause they've confirmed they're running two factory Yamahas next season. You're going to get probably lots of support from the factory cause they want to up their game uh you're gonna get you know you're gonna you're gonna get opportunities he didn't have at ktm so i feel like it's one of those things of you'd be stupid if you turn it down really it's one of those it's a, it's a hail mary really at trying to keep his MotoGP career and dreams alive um and i mean if he goes for it fair play to him he, he's you know he went out in germany at uh, the saxon ring replaced Renz. Did, did well, I thought. I feel he did a a, a good job. Um, yeah, I thought he was good as, too. I thought about as good as you could expect, yeah. And now he's replacing... Is he replacing Rins or Crutchlow at, um, <laughs> at Silverstone? It all got a bit confusing. And I'm not sure where he's going now, which is... It rins, is Rins going to be fit? I can't remember. I, that's the thing. I know Cal's unfit, but I can't remember if... I think it's to replace Cal. I think surely Rins is fit by now. He's had four weeks, five weeks off or something now. Surely he is. I, I honestly can't remember. But anyway, Remy's going to be there. He's going to be at Silverstone replacing whoever. 
he's going to be on a factory Yamaha bike. Um, you know, historically, they've not been great when they throw in a, a wild card at, at Silverstone Yamaha, but it's one of those things. There's a chance for Remy to impress, and it's just a, a dress rehearsal, really, for for would he be good enough for a Primax seat? And I think so far, he's, he's putting himself across well, and I think he's probably getting along with Yamaha to even get the opportunity. So, but I mean, their other options don't look, they're not abundant, are they? I mean, because Frankie's not going to stay. Even if they wanted him, which I don't sure they even do, to be honest, but even if they wanted him, I think it'd take a lot of convincing when you know that he could probably just walk onto a VR46 bike, no issues. Um, you would not be able to convince him to stay. No way. So there are other options. That, who else are you looking at? You know, I mean, there are guys that you can maybe like, oh, he'll be free. He'll be available. But would you prefer him to Remy? You know, you're looking at like Augusto Fernandez. I don't even know who else. There's... Originally, just looking at my phone in front of me where I had my predictions at one point earlier this season, I had Digi and Oliveira going there. But now it seems like Digi's been um Digi's been always bribed to stay at VR forty six by offered this uh this factory Ducati that all of a sudden has appeared out of nowhere to right. to keep him at um yeah, he's apparently gonna get a twenty twenty five spec Ducati at VR forty six next year, which will you know, has never happened for for Bez. So <laughs> it's one of those things that's trying to keep him around, I think. So they obviously see he's got talent and he was close to walking, I think, the Pramac. So now let's talk Oliveira's going to get announced at Silverstone as a Pramac rider. Um, so really for that second bike, your options are Franco, who's not going to do it. He's not going to go back to Yamaha. He burnt too many bridges there, I think. Your other options are Miller, Remy, and obviously there's been the talk of Top Rack doing it, but Top Rack won't do it. I, I just his management won't allow him to do that sort of decision. So, you know, all the people who want him in MotoGP, I'd love to see him wildcard. Don't get me wrong, but it's never going to happen full time. And the only other person I can think of is Rins dropping down from the factory team to the satellite team. But then who's gonna? Yeah, you need to fill that spot anyway, don't you? You still need to find a rider for that one. So I think he's in a really good position at the moment, Remy. I mean, like like when you really break it down, there's not really that many other good options. And Remy's starting to find form in Superbikes at the right time. And he's been given this opportunity here, and he did well in Germany. And I think he'll go okay again. Like if he has just a decent run around, like that's all you need, really. Like what can you expect from a guy on his, you know, on a a ship bike? You know, he's not going to run around with, Fabio is he? So you can only expect him to run around at the back, but just be decent and not fall too far behind. And you think, well, if we gave him a full preseason and a full season, he'll probably be good, you know. Um, so I think he's, he's positioned himself beautifully here, Remy. I think just to pounce at the right time. Timing's everything, isn't it? Yeah, you have to think that they've been trialing him for this MotoGP seat because otherwise they would have given Johnny Ray the opportunity, or That's they right. would have given. Locatelli, the opportunity, or yeah. Dom you, you take one of your factory guys and be like, well, they're our best guys, technically. Yeah. So, sort of a, a, an apology to Johnny Ray for how bad it's been going in, in, in Worlds this season. Here, yeah. have a go on a MotoGP bike again. Like, so yeah, to throw it to one of what is effectively, I guess, one of your satellite superbike teams, I suppose. Yeah. Um, to one of your riders going. there. I think that's, um, I think that just says that, like, we're looking at you for that role. Yeah. He is going into the season. He was effectively their fourth rider, I'd have to say, Yamaha and World mm-hmm. Superbike. It would obviously have been Johnny was coming in to be their number one rider. Locker was always their number two. Uh, Domi was probably their number three. And then Remy was of, was their fourth option. And then down to Ertel and Bradley Ray. But I think to give this opportunity to him big, it's something you know he'll go for. Because with Honda, you see they bring in Ike Lacona when they need to replace someone who's obviously, you know, it's Via, Hay or Lekawona. They're both, I'd say, level in Worlds. Neither of them have been that great. The Honda's rubbish anyway, but it's the thing of, they've got to be bringing Remy in for a reason. Otherwise, they'd be bringing in Cal more often. Obviously, he's been injured. So I think Cal's the, the logical person to bring in. He's been injured. Who do we go for then? Well, we've got the seat that we can't seem to fill because nobody wants it. Let's see if Remy wants it. And sure enough, Remy would probably take this opportunity to get back into MotoGP. So 
they, they've got to be out there. There's, there's, in my mind, there's no other logical sort of way of looking at this other than they are trialing Remy for this this bike next mm. year. This bike has magically appeared this season for for next season. Something they didn't probably think at the start of the season was going to happen. And now it is. And he's contracted to Yamaha. So it's, it's an easy a, one for him. It's yeah. easy, I think. I, I, more than anything else, I think it's an easy, like, keep someone, like you said, he's already contracted to, to a Yamaha contract. You know, like, he probably got shafted way too early in his MotoGP career anyway. So you'd think he should, by all rights, probably at least have had last season. Hmm. Um, so, you know, it's, it is one of those things. Um, but, I mean, you've got like a provisional little list there of where you think the grid's going to end up like? Yeah, I'd have to do some changes off the top of my head, but I have a provisional sort of in my mind now where I think the grid's going to be. So we've spoken about Trackhouse. We've spoken about the uh, Pramac Yamaha. I guess Rins is a lock pretty much to re-sign at the factory team. Unless Um, they can talk someone like Sergio Garcia into taking that ride or Manu Gonzalez maybe I don't see unless they do just go all out and say Rins you've had your you know it's not been great let's be honest Rins so we're going to bring in a rookie to just give him a go alongside Fabio because I, I, I can't really see that though I can't see why that would be better than having yeah him. it's just one of those things that was the the only other thing I could think of other than Rins would be bringing in a younger uh, a younger talent from Moto 2 but Sergio is not ready I don't think and Manu Gonzalez was linked to the Primac team but that sort of went away very quickly so it's just one of those Manu always gets linked to a ride and then it disappears very quickly so <laughs> yeah yeah, it, yeah. it'll be Rins probably it'll stay as Rins I think that's pretty much yeah I, I like you said there are things that could happen there but I think it'll be highly unlikely um i guess there's not much else then is there it's we've Brilliant. spoken about Pramac, like i said it's the second grassini seat that would be able to go and takanakagami seat uh and then obviously vr46 so VR, we're expecting that to be digi and then probably frankie morbidelli yeah most likely that'll be the that'll be the duo there. and then firming out again that means he by default has to get the grassini seat yeah i don't um, see rossi or uccio being bullied by Ducati. not saying they would be but i wouldn't see them sitting there and going yeah we'll take a ride if we didn't want yeah they'll they'll always look after frankie because frankie was really mm. their first unless they could somehow one. be like you have to make sure you've got room for frankie at grassini then but then what's the point of that yeah as well just, then, yeah you know um so and then it's just whether tacker i mean the only way tacker i suppose doesn't keep his seat is if ayagura goes there yeah or well, do they get bold and go some cat chantra if they are fed up of Taka? But I think Taka's been a good servant. I, I, yeah. I get, I, you know, I'm a big Taka guy. I'm a big Taka guy. Yeah. I like, I like him. I like and I think yeah. you could do a lot worse. You could definitely do a lot worse, especially if you're Honda, when your bike's rubbish anyway, and you know that really good riders like me last season could just go and crash it every week. So bringing a rookie in there, an unknown quantity like Chantra, who I like very quick on his day, but doesn't really seem to be able to push it to that level to have a consistent title challenge um in moto two so he's on and off kind of rider um so to replace a guy that like you said this year hasn't always only crashed out of two races two grand prix did you say he's racked up a few points for finishing 14th a fair few times so why like just no point to Make a change there, you know, if it ain't broke. Um, so for a guy that lo- again loses this seat every single year, but still manages to be on the grid somehow. Um, yeah, he he's just a loyal servant. He's what like Aoyama was to Honda, just stuck around forever, whether it was in a test rider role or in replacing Danny when he obviously would pick up a broken collarbone every year. Like it was just he was that loyal servant, and it seems like that's what Tak has sort of stepped in and gone. Aoyama's retired. I'm now that sort of Japanese loyal servant that will be around for what seems like forever. Taka at this point feels like he's about 40 because it feels like he's been around for so long, but he hasn't really when you look at it. How he's not that old. Taka? No, he's just been around for, he's only, he's only 32. He's been around for 
he's done 106 races in in MotoGP already. Like, what a career! He's been around for so long. He's had one pole position, no podiums, and no wins. Like, that's enough to get someone kicked off the MotoGP grid so many times. Yet, Tak is still there. He's clinging on for dear life. And that's just that. That's just the Honda thing, isn't it? Because if you were looking at merit, you'd be like, look, let's say um, Trackhouse didn't go for Miller or whatever, and Miller didn't want to go to Superbikes. You think natural thing would be like, well, he's probably better than Taka. So Honda, if you're just trying to get the best possible rider, you'd go after a guy like that or, you know, maybe someone else. Um, but they're obviously not that interested in that. They do want it to be a Japanese guy or at least someone it's from that sort of, like you said, Chantra might be like, so maybe a guy within that sort of family, even though he's not Japanese, I don't know, would that satisfy the sponsors? Probably to Itamitsu, they operate in Thailand, I suppose. So like, I suppose. I yeah. Know. I mean, I don't know. I've, I've no idea, but I guess that would be their other option because there's no other viable Japanese option at the moment. Um, and whether there will be for a while, I don't know. And if I doesn't want it, and it has to be a like an Asian guy, then it's probably got to be Taka. Now, if they're willing to go outside of that, there are options. Yeah, but then you risk losing your sponsor. So, yeah. So yeah. it kind of does have to be him. Um, and they sponsor their junior teams in Moto Two and Moto Three as well. So. So when they side on for that, I'm assuming they're thinking like, well, if you've got to move one of them out, you have to bring one of them in, right? Like yeah. they're our guys. We're pushing them through. It's our money, you know? So that second LCR bike only came about when Taka came around in 2018 and it's always been in Mitsu since. So I've, I, again, I don't know if it's true. It might just be the way I thought about it, but the way I've always seen it is that bike is sponsored by Itamitsu because it's an Asian rider. Yeah, otherwise it doesn't exist, right? Because you're right. I, I almost forgot about it. LCR always just ran the one bike. Yeah, always. They it were, was like they Casey always... Stoner, and then like they had like Randy Dupunye on it or something. <laughs> there was had... never two. Yeah, there was Cal. It was Cal for years. Cal, so yeah, was Cal, yeah. Oh, Jack, the... they, they had two bikes then, did they actually? But that was a was it CRT? Those bikes which sort of saved my OGP. Um, oh yeah, because they could run like those whatever they were they were like some yeah. weird hybrid type i think like, but it, was like it was jack's... kind of a grand prix bike but not really it didn't have everything i don't think jack's bike was a real it seems weird to say i don't think jack's bike was a real moto gp bike <laughs> that is weird to say <laughs> it, was, um, yeah, it was like I... some sort of like weird thing that wasn't a full-on moto gp bike they're like we can't have 14 bikes on the grid the only thing I remember from Jack that year, anyway, is taking out Cal at the yeah, British Grand Prix. So that was that was actually pretty devastating. What um, was Jack? Yeah, Jack was on an open LCR Honda. He wasn't on, and Cal was on a a proper LCR Honda. Is that <laughs> like I don't know how to refer to them. Um, yeah, Jack was on an RC21 3V RS, whereas Cal was on the RC21 3V. So yeah, Jax wasn't a, a proper Honda. It truly so, was the dark ages, wasn't it? Um, again, that was that wasn't yeah, that was just they had two bikes, but one wasn't a uh, a proper if you like. Yeah, but that was probably and then and then when it was like back to a full normal proper grid, that was always like an Itamitsu bike Japanese rider type deal. Um, cause yeah, I remember years and years before that LCR, that was just one bike, and no one cared. That was fine, like whatever. Um, but yeah, interesting one. It has to, it has to be Taka then. It has to be Taka. Yeah. Uh, and that's, we filled the grid. So that's done. So, uh, I guess all that's left is who wins it from here. Um, oh, does he go for the three peat? I mean, on current form, it's got to be Paco. If he continues it into the, after the summer break, you know, he's just got married. He's, he's, it looks like he's had a really good summer break from his social media. His head's probably going to be in a good space. He's won the last four Grand Prix in a bounce. And he's had Martin crash out in the last Grand Prix before the summer break. Martin is going to want to win it, but will Ducati want Martin to win it? Mark, I will go out on a limb here and say he won't win it. 
<laughs> that's that's my my thoughts from here. Mark went winner. I think he's so too I've, far back already. Yeah. Yeah. It's between those two, and I just I think historically, when you look at the Grand Prix we've got coming up, Peko's been better than Martin. So I'd go out, especially at the flyaways. I feel like Peko clicks into them easier than than Martin does. So Peko from here is the the obvious answer, really. It's the simple but obvious answer. Yeah, and he's he's won the last four, hasn't he? Grand Prix. Yeah. And he's won five of the last six, and he was on the podium mm-hmm. in the other one, which was mm-hmm. in Le Mans. Yeah. Now, that's not including sprints. Uh, I'm just talking about Grand Prix there. Um, yeah. But really, that's where the big boy points come from. So I think you have to say, I mean, unless you're just predicting something different to happen, your prediction must have to be Peko, right? If you're thinking that like form gets tipped on its head a little bit, like, because I get, I say that, but Martin was leading till a lap to go in Germany, mm-hmm. right? So it could have easily yeah. won that. But say he does win that, Peko second. Peko second. And you know, that sometimes when Peko wins, Martin isn't always second, you know. Um, but it, it's kind of form now for Peko where you're like, as long as he takes that through to the second half of the season, even if Martin wins a race, he's probably going to be right behind him. In fact, I'm looking now, Martin, just the two Grand Prix wins this season, isn't it? And his last one was in Le Mans. So that's one, two, three, at least four Grand Prix ago. So Again, because Peko's won the last four. So, I mean, you, I think you, has, you have to be saying Peko. And again, Peko now, you, he's, he's in that mood now where you can put him on anything in any race. He's probably got to win. Like he did at his little, their little um, Moto, the Grand, Ducati World Grand Prix, whatever they did, right? Yeah. And he's just going out there. He's like, oh, they're all on, well, it's all the new Panigale, isn't it? Whatever they're on. They're on the same thing. And Peko's like, well, I'm the best. So I'll win it. You know? And he did. I know it's a bit of an exhibition, although Mark did torpedo someone into the final corner, but yeah, it's just what he does. But but, but again, it's just for me, it's just like illustrates where Peko's kind of at. You know, I, I just see him as like he just he's just going you could put him in any race in any bike in the world right now, and he'd probably walk on it being like, I'll probably be on the front row and I'll probably be very close to winning this race. I'll probably win it. It's just he's got this thing going on. Um and while he's in that form. And I do believe he will carry that form on. I'm not saying he's going to win every race, but he will carry that form on. I think he's going to be largely unbeatable from here. Yeah, I'd be, I'd just, I'd be shocked if he wasn't. Yeah, I've just looked at um, last year's championship and last year's results from sort of this point on. Obviously, Catalonia's was still to go at this point last season, and obviously we had the Indian Grand Prix last year, which we won't have. Um, but from this point on. Uh, Peko was on the podium in every race other than one, and that was in India. Whereas Martin was only on the podium in five of the last races of the season last year. So will it repeat? Uh, you know, it's MotoGP. Anything can happen. But if history is to go by, I'd have to say Peko is more likely to have the dominant second half of the season compared mm. to to martin but that's just you know that's just one year Thing, things can change martin has a point to prove to ducati big bosses he wants to take that number one to of course over to um over to a prettier like you know we've, we've seen people do it in the past so he wants to do it he wants to take that number one he you know he'd run at uh, prettier just to spite ducati I he would. seems like a sort of person I absolutely yeah. would well, in British Superbike, Tommy Bridewell's done it to, at Honda because he's moved across from PBM. You know, he, he's he's done it because he won it and then, for whatever reason, isn't in the team anymore. So, yeah, he'd do it. Yeah, and look, I, I, whether you think it's an even fight from here on, because obviously once you announce you're leaving, I don't know. Like, I'm not 100% sure on the ins and outs of how it works, right? At the end of the day, it is the same bike. I do think Peko, something happens between a Saturday and a Sunday for Peko that's something weird happens. I don't know if that's from the team and the support that maybe you don't get somewhere else at a different team, even if you are on the latest spec bike. I don't know. Um, so whether you think it's a fair fight, whatever, 
right? But like I said, Mark, I don't think is there again on the old spec. So maybe that definitely rules him out, but I think he's too far behind anyway. If you gave him a, the latest bike right now, I still don't think he'd get there. Um, and Peko, I just think he's too good. As simple as that. I think he's too good at the moment. Um, fair fight or not. So, um, yeah, that's where I've got it. And I mean, I, I think we've talked about just about everyone. I mean, there's like your Bastianinis and stuff. I mean, weird move for him, is it, to go to KTM satellite team from there? He, I think he felt a little bit poor, but uh, poor, forced out of uh, Ducati. So he's gone to KTM where he'll get a factory bike guaranteed, factory support at Tech Free, uh, same as Vinales. I saw a weird quote from Vinales where he said, it's the first time I've been able to almost follow my, I can't remember the exact quote, but the, the gist of it was it's the first time he's been able to follow his gut and make a gut decision in his career. So I don't know whether he's split ways with his agent and, you know, he's made this deal on his own or. So he never wanted to take the factory Yamaha seat and be Valentino Rossi's teammate. Well, he probably didn't. <laughs> he probably would rather if Rossi was gone than <laughs> when he stepped into that seat. He probably thought Rossi was retiring. I think Yamaha did think Rossi was going to retire. But yeah, mm. he, he's an odd one, Vinales. He's always been an odd one. And it always feels like a little bit Fernando Alonso, uh, Alonso with his uh with his career moves, where he almost goes from where you, you feel like he should stay and then all of a sudden he's like, "No, nah, I'm leaving. I'm going. To, I'm going to this team." It's like he was super annoyed that um, Martin was there. Probably was. Like, well, I'm not going to beat him, am I? Geez, what'd you do that for? I thought I was your number one guy. Ah, oh, fucking, I'm out of here. I mean, he's done it a lot. I'll go, be, Yamaha. Or I'll go be number four somewhere else. Yeah, he did it at Yamaha. He decided to up and leave when when Fabio was comfortably beating him. Well, he didn't just up and leave. He tried to blow up the bike. Um, yeah, sometimes I think like I, I I have nothing against the guy. He seems perfectly lovely. Yeah. Like a nice man, you know. But sometimes I just look through his career, I'm like, fuck, I just wouldn't hire that guy. I just would not hire him. I just wouldn't do it. I I prefer to just keep Jack there. He has his that's the thing with Maverick. He has his days, which could make him good. But then Jack has his days, I guess. They all have their days when they're good. It's just he just I mean, seems Mav's, a bit... Mav's good days can be really good. I get it. Like really good. I understand. Yeah. Like but at the end America, of the day, what's yeah. that one race win gotta do for you every two years? Like I mean he should have two this year. You think Port him out and then his bike true. seized that up. True. That was that stretch where he was doing really well. And then it's disappeared again. Yeah, so... but where's he yeah, that's what I mean. Where's he gone since then? And it's not like the yeah. Aprilia has gone less competitive since then, because if anything, Oliveira and Fernandez have gotten more competitive since then. He'll probably win in Silverstone now, you do realise. He'll he'll because he likes Silverstone, he'll show up and he'll win. He's always in contention for a win there at Silverstone. So we'll see. We'll see how he goes. We'll see how he goes. Um, I, I, yeah, you know, that will happen now that I've, I've just said that about it. But anyway, he comfortably win by like five <laughs> seconds. Well. He'll just do what he did. The most Maverick yeah. Vinales ride ever. And he'll just go from, he'll qualify on pole and he will just get the perfect start that he never normally gets. And he will just right off away from all of them and then it'll be a massive scrap for second between like Peko, Martin and Mark and they'll be knocking wings off and someone will end up upset and Maverick would just not care imagine it, that'd be nice wouldn't it it'd be funny I think if that happens now it's, it's, like, it's a Maverick thing to do, it really is um yeah I mean I, th- I, mean, I think we've covered everyone I think we've covered everyone I mean there's uh, the Mark thing to Ducati we never really discussed yeah, but I mean, it's like it's, it's it was so long, long ago now. now. Yeah, and it you know we'll have time to discuss that. I think between seasons. Yeah, I think that um, because cool. it has no bearing now. I don't think on what happens for the rest of the season. No, it has nothing um, they can do to influence him now. No, um, it was a huge call though. Would you have done it? Um, keeping it short, no, I wouldn't. I can see that Rossi hat behind you, mate. I it's not because of that. <laughs> It's not. It's not just. I've got two, so um, I also wouldn't have done it. I <laughs> wouldn't have done it purely from the thing of his age, and I know it sounds weird because Mark's got the face that really does not age. No matter what he's been through, 
he you could still think he was in his mid twenties. Yeah, I could have sworn he was twenty five. Yeah, next season he's going to be thirty two, and it's a two year deal, so he'd be thirty three by the end of his deal. So, I think George was the better George. I think Martin was the better option to go for. Of, Georgie. Yeah, I call him George Martin at home just because <laughs> George it's, Martin. It's funnier to call him George Martin than Jorge Martin. He sounds like like an eighties pop singer. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, he's just he's got the he's got the youth on his side. You know, would you rather have a rider who? And sorry, you know, Martin like has fans. He's coming to the end of his career. You know, one more big injury would probably do it for him. I'd say. You know, he's got that risk of diplopia. Would you rather have the younger rider who's got his whole future ahead of him, or the older rider who's gonna bring conflict into this garage? You know, I, I think I would have gone for the younger or kept Bastianini and kept the um the 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 harmony there. In fact, with Ducati, yeah, I because... actually think that that was a low key, really good option for them. Yeah, and it was like the least popular option and probably the least option that made the least sense in terms of like there's always this thing where like you just have to put your two quickest guys on the two on your two best bikes like on your factory team but it never used to always be like that it never when Honda used to just run like toro akawa next to rossi and everyone yeah. was like brilliant and like barros and stuff and biaggi would be on satellite bikes yeah jibbernell would be on us in grassini but you're like oh yeah but who's rossi's teammate be like toro akawa like, okay like, yeah like it that was what work. you did because you just wanted one guy to win. Yeah, think about Yamaha when they put Rossi and Lorenzo together. It didn't work. Well, I mean, they won everything, so it kind of did work. Yeah, but then it drove Rossi out, and then he came back. Yeah. Obviously, after yeah. uh, after yeah. all that disaster yeah. happened, but it just historically doesn't work when you put I think Dewan and Crivier when they were together in the nineties. It just didn't work. They hate they won everything, but they hated each yeah. other. I guess it's just like, do you win everything and just not bother about the consequences? As long as you, and then you've got the two biggest names, it creates the most amount of thing. Maybe you, I don't know, is it still a thing that you, you know, you win on Sunday, you sell on Monday? I don't know. No, Maybe it's, it's worth bike sales for them. No, I don't. I, I that think argument has been made. It's like Mark Marquez sells more bikes in Spain. Yeah, Maybe. Well, how many? Yeah, I don't know. Is that yeah. still a thing? I don't think it is from the OGP. If I don't saw... either. I'm not going to watch a prototype series and be like, I'll buy a Panigale. Yeah, I watch World Superbikes maybe and think, well, which one's better? You know, maybe. But at the end of the day, if I was buying a bike, I'd probably just go to the dealership and maybe test them. Yeah, so kind of like more. I, I don't know if that's a yeah. real thing anymore. I don't think it is. I think that's an old, that's an old like early two thousands sort of nineties sort of thing that I think has died out, but people try to keep saying. But I've never. I don't ride better bikes. I don't have a license. I've never bought one. But I wouldn't look at it and go, wow, Peko's winning in MotoGP. I've got to get a Ducati. Or Top Rack's dominating in Worlds. I need to get a BMW. The thing is, is it is the only thing is like, because they release like liveries, don't they? Yeah. Does a Marquez 96 bike sell more than just a normal panic? Like, do you know what I mean? That Or than yeah. like a, a Martin 89 bike, whatever the number is. Yeah, it, it sells more. Like Jonathan Ray went to Yamaha. They straight away released a Jonathan Ray R1. Mm. So, yeah, it, it sells more in Spain, probably in Italy, than it would if it was a, a Martin or a or a Bastianini. So, maybe maybe that works for him. I mean, I don't. Again, I don't know. I don't know if I'd buy a replica bike, not a new one anyway. Like I wouldn't no. buy a Banyaya one. I buy like a Troy Bayless one or something. You know, some of them look cool, but some of them look quite tacky. I think sometimes yeah. like you like, ride around the streets every day on your, on your, or, or like maybe your Sunday bike, you know, every weekend. And you're like, you're like, you look like you're hitting the track. But you're just going up through the peak district or something. Yeah. Like you see, like I see quite often Repsol, like Repsol Honda 125 Hondas. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, there's so many of those, <laughs> but to be fair, it's different. I think if it's like a Repsol or something, mm. But they all have 26 on the front there. All Danny Pedroza bikes around me. And I don't know why. Like I see them and I'm like, why I see, I wouldn't going? want a number on mine. I wouldn't want a number. I'd want maybe the old livery. Like I'd love a Lucky Strike Suzuki yeah, or something. Yeah, they, they are nice. Was that su Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kevin Schwantz, yeah. Yeah. I'd want, but I don't know if I need necessarily need a number on it. True. 
you know, I've got headlights on the front, you know, or like an old Barry Sheen livery or something. But like, I, I, I think that'd be cool, but I wouldn't want like race sponsors on there and numbers and stuff. I just want the actual livery, you know, the colors. True. So I don't know if it would help. I mean, maybe I'm the wrong person to ask. Maybe people, again, like you said, this Repsol shit all over the, like you go to like Thailand or something, there's a million little Repsol um, scooters getting about. Yeah. You know? So. We, you just send about old liveries. This weekend, they've got the old liveries, 75 edition, they're running anniversary. Are you excited to, to see um, what do you want to see? I I'm guess. very excited. I'm very excited. Um, I... I always wonder with ones that are like newer teams, like Trackhouse, yeah. what do you do? Yeah. Even Aprilia. I mean, actually, no, Aprilia, definitely you have to do the white it's one with the lions cube. on it. Yeah, they have to do the cube. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you've got to do it. I don't want going back to some weird livery they had when they were sh- like, when they were always a bit shit, but when they were really shit. Like a 125 livery. I, I don't want that. I want the cube when it was awful. I want them to run that. <laughs> that bike was dreadful. And I want to see the livery. I like the time. old liveries they used to have, Jeremy Williams. Um, yeah, they were nice. And and they also ran the same livery in 250s and 125s on that one. Manuel Poggiali had it. That's the one I want for Aprilia. Yep. But for track house, like, do you do one for Rapilia and one old livery for track house? Yeah, got to, I guess. Just do a you know, classic like red, white, and blue. Just go for the. Yeah. I mean, Ducati, oh, obviously, wow. you've got some old livery you can use, a red one. They did one one time and it had the silver on it. I thought that was nice enough. Yeah. Like, uh, they'll probably do something like that. Honda and Yamaha, take your pick. Oh, so many. No Suzuki anymore, which is probably the biggest disappointment. Yeah. Because um, they had they the they best do. ones. Um, but I guess Honda can't go to a, like a just straight back to a Repsol, can they? So it's gonna have to be a Rothman. It'll be one of that old, old, yeah, Rothman style one would be nice. I've not really thought of that. That'd be sweet. There's so many ways with that. I know you, did I see you earlier on Twitter? Said you wanted an Astro Zero livery, for yeah, the because I'm thinking an old Rossi livery, but someone since yeah. commented, I've seen it just before I jumped on here, being like. A Ducati team's not got to run an old Honda livery. Yeah. But then I've seen another person also commented one on that, what I posted, and said they're expecting it to be the old Yamaha, Golwa Yamaha, because there's a bit of them mixing a blue color in it. Like, that's the Golwa Yamaha blue. It's like, so, well, they wouldn't run a Yamaha livery if they're not going to yeah. run a Honda one. So, do they run an old Ducati livery? You know, do all the Ducati rooms, or do you run an old G- livery of your team? Like, did Grassini run a Telefonica Movistar? You know, that'd be, they- that'd be awesome. They'll go with a Fausto Grassini one, I reckon. The mm. the white one that they ran. Yeah, yeah, that actually has a good shout. Yeah, yeah, they'll yeah, go with yeah. that. Really good shout. But yeah, they will do that. Fair. I think. I don't know. Will Rossi go for like the Sky one because that's the only ever old school one for that. Team. That's what I mean. Like, if they're not going to run, like they're not going to run an old Ducati one. That's just red. Yeah. Okay, so Ducati's going to do that. They're all red, I suppose. Have Ducati done anything else? I mean, I don't know. So surely they, as a Rossi team, they're going to run an old Rossi livery. Yeah. That's what I would want to do. I know it's like, oh, yeah. it's a Honda livery. Yeah, it's not really. It wasn't a factory team when he was riding for that. You know, he was separate from the. It wasn't a Repsol. You no. know, the reps. It was a Nastro Azzurro. Yeah. And yeah. it was yellow. Nastro was. I don't know if you've seen a bottle of Peroni, Luke. It's not yellow. <laughs> the yellow was for him. That is true. The Nastro is Azzurro true. was the blue bit, you know? Yeah. So the yellow, so the little bit of blue along the bottom, and then the yellow, the rest of it. With the silver stripes on it, that's that's what I want to say. That's yeah. what I want to say. I mean, it's not it's taking another factory livery, is it? No, it's no, no. His no livery. They're not. Honda aren't going to turn around and go, yeah, but we wanted to use that because they wouldn't. No, of course not. Of course not. They just there. There are a few I'm excited for. KTM. Mm-hmm. I don't know where they're going to go. They'll go that old. The first one they did in that Valencia Grand Prix. What was that? 2016 when they turned up. Oh yeah. They, there's or they go yeah like those old like KTM liveries where they're really orange. Like from the one two fives yeah. and that, yeah, yeah, they'll go mostly with that. just an orange bike. Gas, gas. You probably go for an old gas, gas sort of style before they were MotoGP. Bit of motocross style, maybe. Yeah. Again, L- LCR have a lot of options. They could really yeah, go back. They're they like could bring the very out. similar forever. They could bring the Playboy style out, Randy the Pony style. Oh, yeah. They could. 
they could bring that back. Well, I think that other than this year when it's gone full cast roll, right? I think their bikes always been the exact same thing. They're just like, here's a white billboard, put your name on it. Yep. It's always been pretty much the same. What about the old like Casey Stoner 250s, like Carrera, LCR? Because he rode for them in like 250. Yeah. And they had like a Carrera. Yeah. It was like reddish, I want to say. Yeah, I was that. Yeah. But there's yeah. A few. There's a few that I'd like to see, but Pramac will go for that old red and white one that they had when they first came through. Well, maybe the green and white one they had with, what was it Caparossi was on that? Yeah. That was, was there a time? <laughs> was there a time way, way back when, I want to say, where there was like this weird, like sort of three colored, like an orange, white, and blue or something? Oh, maybe. They've had some horrible. I'm talking like 2003 or something. There's a chance. It's been bad a few times, but <laughs> they've always just slapped something on the bike, haven't they? Uh, the green and white one was bad. I kind of wanted to run it just for that because I think it would be just so bad. I'd want to see it again. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just one of those hard ones because, like, you just want to be able to say to, like, um, someone like Trackhouse, I, maybe not Trackhouse, but Gas Gas, something like, look, can you just do, like, an old Suzuki one just for the crack? Or an old Tech 3 one. What's an old Tech 3 one? They can't go black and green oh, yeah, anymore. Tech three. Yeah, you maybe a lot of them are Yamaha. Yeah, should go Tech 3. A lot of them are Yamaha related. Could you really go that route? I'm trying to get way back now. Do you just go for their, when they first came across and it was just orange, just straight up orange, <laughs> like a tango bottle. Just Yeah, I liked that. I liked it. I thought it was cool. Um, the Petrucci one. Yeah, Petrucci and Lacona. Yeah. Um, the but I, I mean I, I'm also thinking with them, like you said, they the, all of their other liveries are very Yamaha because they were the mm. they were were they the Gulwa colours for a while? Yeah, and they were bright yellow at one point as well. Yeah, they had the monster ones. Yeah. They had that blue that blue and orange one in when they were KTM. Um Cyrene and God, who was the other one that was on that? Who was the F1 that was on that bike? I know it was bad. Um, they had Hafiz Sirene and someone else on it. Wasn't the best looking bike, but I reckon they go for that. <laughs> I reckon one year we just go for the ugliest MotoGP liveries we've ever had. Yeah, every team just runs one of the like 10 worst liveries ever. I think we get people to vote on what was their worst ever liveries and they just have to run it for a Grand Prix just because it would be so funny to see these awful looking bikes. Try and keep it to that sort of style, but try and make it look good. <laughs> well, you've got to use all these colours that don't work together, but like have some striking cool livery. Yeah, they've just got to try and make it good, even though they were just horrible to look at. There are a few. Well, I think we might have to leave it there, mate. Um, uh, uh, now that we can, we've built into the weekend with our um, livery chat. I yeah. do uh, low key one of my favourite parts about or oh, well, that I'm looking forward to this weekend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think there was something else I was going to say, but I can't bloody remember now. So are they, we'll there, I think. do you know if they're running them Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or if it's just no idea? I've I've only seen a bit of chat on like Twitter and stuff. People sort of asking about it. Um, and some people commenting different things. I think the last thing I saw was someone saying they are supposed to be running it from Friday. I think you they may as well. You may, yeah, you may as well rock it. Or do you I want to be like they unveil like Sunday race day, just bang, jump, turn off on the grid with a brand new livery? No, they'll do it Thursday. They'll keep it. They'll do it a day of champions, which is fair enough. Do it at the charity yeah. event. Like, yeah, it, it makes sense. Uh, there, there are some, I think there are going to be, be some underwhelming ones. But yeah, of course, it'd just it be underwhelming be. if one of the great factories doesn't go with one of their best liveries. You know what I mean? If Yamaha go more like movie star than um, a red and white or a yellow and white, yeah, then be surely they're going all the way back to that. Yeah, you have to. That, They've already won the yellow both. one before, the Kenny Roberts one before, haven't they? Yeah, but you could run both. Do one as a red and yeah, white, why and do not one just do a... one on each bike? That's another yeah. thing. I didn't they, think used they used to do it. Yamaha, they used to run. The, the two different liveries so Honda hey, can do two different well. bloody tie manufacturers at one point they can do two liveries 
yeah they were, yeah just stick a little monster logo somewhere and you'll be fine yeah, exactly like i think those those red ones and the yellow ones that you're saying they're actually are good probably for sponsors because they leave a lot of good open space yeah. they're not too busy those liveries that is one thing i don't know how they're going to get around all these sponsors trying to fit them into old liveries i've thought about that a few times yeah it could actually ruin a few of them maybe yeah because there'll be a few where they've just got a stick like a massive idamitsu sponsor in like or a massive like over a playboy uh, sticker you know yeah they've just got to be a <laughs> massive um castro sticker somewhere where they just probably wouldn't use it yeah like, i mean uh, zarko's already running a retro livery yeah surely they would keep it Surely you just make it look a little bit more colin edwards just get him on it just get colin edwards on it to be oh. fair why not why not yeah. We've already mentioned that's Colin Evans had two mentions in this chat already. He that needs, definitely needs to be on the bike. Just turns up and does it. Yeah. Well, if you're watching Colin, thanks. Uh, you know, we're flying the flag for you. Big fan, Cole. I'm a big fan. Uh <laughs> I remember when Colin Edwards used to take a at Phillip Island, he used to turn up, I don't know if you did it everywhere. So they used to do like a rider parade at Phillip Island. And he used to come with like a t shirt gun. T shirts out. It was awesome. I never got one. Would have been nice, but uh yeah. What a legend. All right, mate. I'll uh we'll leave it there. I'll drop yeah. in the down below in the description like where we can find you, like Twitter and all that. Um yep. and stuff like that. So you can keep up yeah. with Luke. He knows more about MotoGP than me, so definitely follow him. Uh and we'll see it. Well, I mean we'll maybe catch up before the end of the season but if not we'll catch up at the end of the season we've got to go over our um predictions which i think a few of them are already settled to yeah be honest. but yeah that'll be fun that'll be fun all right uh i hope everyone enjoys the grand prix luke you as well are you going i'm not no i'm me not neither. me neither no. disappointing but i have got the weekend off so i'll be watching every session pretty much Same. live it's going to be on free to wear i think in the uk as well which it is it's going to be on tv yeah Fantastic. All right. Well, enjoy the weekend and uh, we'll see everyone. Well, I'll see everyone anyway after after the race. I'll do a little post-race thing that I usually do sometimes. All right. Catch you later, mate. See you later.